We are grateful uh, to those who have come uh, this evening to the House of Commons to talk about the future expectations for Hong Kong. Uh, the next speaker is Edward Leung Tin Kai, somebody who is a young activist um, in Hong Kong. So Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Learn, and today I'm very honored to be given the chance to speak on behalf of my people in Hong Kong because last year I was deprived of my political right to represent them. My case is, well, is a rather complicated one because last February, during the by election of Legislative Council, more than 66,000 Hong Kong people voted for me. That meant the notion of localism, which was once marginalized, started to resonate among many Hong Kongers, especially the young generation. Unfortunately, that drew the attention from Beijing's watchful eyes. Five months after the by-election, I attempted to run again for office in the general election of Legislative Council so as to realize my dream to be the representative of Hong Kong people. However, the government suddenly required all candidates to sign an extra document an extra declaration which only stated a certain articles about the authority of Beijing over Hong Kong in basic law without any legal consultation beforehand. On top of that, they required some candidates to answer the returning officer's question of whether I was going to advocate Hong Kong independence. That was clearly a political screening, but I couldn't do much about it when the executive branch was so repressive and insisted to interfere in our legislature. Some people say politics is the art of compromise. So I did compromise by signing the confirmation form and renouncing this political belief. It is my official reply to the returning officer. I said, no, I changed my stance. I compromise, I kowtow. Yet, I was still barred from running for office because they said I was not bona fide or sincere enough. So, I wonder what else I could do. It became a thought crime in Hong Kong. By calling it a crime, I'm not exaggerating because sooner or later, Carrie Lam is going to introduce the Article 23 again. She said so. In 2003, the Time Secretary for Security Regina Ip said, by advocating independence in a verbal manner will not be considered a crime. Maybe I was too naive to seriously take the government's stance into account, but nowadays by talking about it, you will lose your political right, even though you apostatize. I fully understand that it is said to be a constitutional responsibility in basic law that the Article 23 should, should be introduced. Yet, if this article is the constitutional responsibility, what about our universal suffrages, suffrages for chief executive and also legislative council, which were promised in the Article 45 and Article 68? Not only Hong Kong's democratization has been delayed by the government for more than a decade, it is now a time of democratic recession because duly elected lawmakers could be removed by Beijing's interpretation of our constitution. Beijing is using our anger, I realize that, which is actually caused by them to tighten its control over Hong Kong in the name of national security. The official Chinese nationalism has been the tool to control our thought, behavior, and community Official nationalism, according to Benedict Anderson, is a governmental policy which involves compulsory state-controlled primary education, state-organized propaganda, official rewriting of history, militarism, and endless affirmation of the identity of nation. It is very easy to give examples in this case. For example, the student movement in 2012 was against the moral and national education that was described as a brainwashing education because a teaching manual described the Chinese Communist Party as an advanced, selfless, and united willing body. Another example is the educational policy of T 
teaching Chinese in Mandarin instead of, instead of our mother tongue, Cantonese. And we have the propaganda in Hong Kong keeps describing the transfer of sovereignty as a very cheerful reunification, even though the majority of Hong Kongers have never agreed nor had a say. Another example is the Umbrella Movement in 2014. It was against the 831 decision made by the National People's Congress and the committee, constructed the extra political venting, ensuring that only those who love the country and love Hong Kong can run for chief executive's office. They must be patriotic. So, all in all, the official Chinese nationalism led to centralization in Hong Kong, and localism emerged as a resistance to assimilation and centralization. Localism in Hong Kong represents a local perspective on our history. We want to preserve our own narrative on the past, present, and future of Hong Kong. We want to retain our identity as Hong Kongers and our Hong Kong culture, including Cantonese and traditional Chinese characters. We want to have an accountable government, that is to say, a democratic one, because I believe Hong Kongers morally deserve it. At this moment, more than a hundred protesters, most of them are in their twenties or early thirties, are facing different prosecutions, and some of them were sentenced for more than three years. While we are paying the price in Hong Kong, the international community needs to act. Twenty years after the transfer of sovereignty, China disavows our social contract, the Sino-British Joint Declaration. As the Chinese Foreign Ministry declared the Joint Declaration a historical document that no longer has any practical significance. While the Joint Declaration is the bedrock of our mini-constitution, basic law, I cannot think of a way to preserve the independent judicial power and the rule of law when the government disrespects this international agreement in this manner. Before it is too late, the international community must review its current foreign policy towards China, investigate the violation of joint declaration, the erosion of our human rights and rule of law, and most importantly, to encourage a political reform in Hong Kong so that conflicts in Hong Kong can be solved in a large scale. We need to realize and remember that something is much more important than the almighty women be. Hong Kong is not a borrowed place on a borrowed time anymore. Hong Kong is our home. We are not doing this for merely for us, for our next generation, but for our children's children. So thank you very much. Final speaker is Anson Song Chan, who is former Chief Secretary in both the British Colonial Government of Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government under the Chinese sovereignty. She was also former member of the Ledge Co. You've been described as the Iron Lady. <laughs> we love Iron Ladies in Britain. <laughs> uh, Iron Fist in a Velvet Glove. Uh, and was number two to the uh, British Governor Chris Patton and later Hong Chi Hua. After retiring from the civil service, uh, Hanson did not show up in public often, but did take part in the protest march for democracy against Donald Sang's constitutional reform package and has since participated in subsequent marches for universal suffrage. Hanson, over to you. Thank you. Uh, since this is the only opportunity I'm going to have this time now to speak on the record of the House of Commons, I'd like to preface my remarks by noting uh, that uh, this year, as we mark Hong Kong's 20th anniversary of our end of the British government has not seen fit to mark this milestone in any meaningful way. 
other than the very short statement issued by the Fourth Amendment, which doesn't even begin to take the China to task for the various occasions and undermining the front of the two systems that have been in China with the front of the Fourth Amendment. So we have seen what we do in the world. It seems to me that at the very least, the British government on this occasion owe to the people of Hong Kong a frank appraisal of how well or not well one country two systems have worked in the past 20 years, and to the extent that there has been erosion of this concept of one country two systems, what is the British government going to do about it? At the same time, it seems to me that the British government also should be, particularly on this occasion, mounting a robust defense of principles underlying one country two systems, the joint declaration and the basic law that is after all based on the principles laid on in the joint declaration. They should be reminding China of its obligations that they solemnly make to the people of Hong Kong and to the wider international community at the time the joint declaration was signed in 1954. I remember being in Beijing witnessing the signing of the document and not the Right, now, to the topic of the day, I'm asked to speak about the future of Hong Kong. Um, when the British, I, I think the argument could be made that the British should have started uh, introducing democracy um, to one more much earlier than they eventually did. Uh, in Hong Kong, we did not have local elections uh, until and it wasn't until 1991 that we had a small number of members of our nation which actually directly invested on the basis of one member. And by the time the British seriously began to grip this problem, I think it had very few cards to the Chinese. That said, I think at the time when Deng Xiaoping crafted the one country two system, um, there is some evidence that even within China, there was a view that maybe China could be to watch over the So you have in the basic law actually a sort of time frame for the introduction of one man, one vote. The basic law actually made clear that 10 years after the handover, which is the year 2000, the people of Hong Kong can decide on their own how fast to move towards universal suffering. And indeed, at that time, all political parties of different political affiliations signed a statement supporting the universal suffrage for the election of the chief executive and four members of the legislature in the year 2007. But of course, the goalposts have been moved time to death, so that today, in the year 2017, that goal seems to be even more elusive. Uh, it looks as if we're not going to see uh, any genuine success or something where the election is achieved and the next time around, it's just And as for selecting all members of the legislature, I do not know when we will actually see something. Now, one male, one vote is not just a strong There is a practical significance and reality to achieving one man, one vote. Because for as long as our chief executive does not enjoy a popular mandate of power, in other words, it lacks the necessary political legitimacy, Mrs. Carrie Lam and her successor will always find it extremely difficult to effectively govern Hong Kong. Never mind about the current very, very strained and fractious relationship between the executive and the legislature. Largely men made and the doing of one person, we are actually I think Carrie herself realized that she needs to work very hard on this problem. And I'm sure that she will take steps to at least improve the relationship. But that's not going to make government any easier. We have been urging Mrs. Carrie then to reopen discussions on universal cooperation. Uh, and she has said to the uh, Prime Minister of Hawaii, this is a very controversial subject, uh, and we are stuck 
the oldest person first, then the rich of and then the and it down by the tendency of the national which in effect gave us a so-called one man one vote, whereby two or three candidates are anointed by the government. The threshold for even being nominated is set at a very, very high level. You have to obtain at least half the number of 1,200 member election committees, which would effectively rule out any democratic member being able to even be nominated because he or she would fail to secure the necessary specific vote for one vote. And we have seen this abundantly displayed with the election in March this year that returned to the On this occasion, as I pointed out in an earlier presentation, the Indian officers and the team did not even bother to describe the fact that they were rigging the election through intimidation, inducement, coercion. Mrs. Terry Dunn herself realized that she is where she is simply because the Indian officers have been defeated. But what I want to note on this occasion is that even, and we do not accept, but even if we accept the framework and the government of the Constitution, it is simply not true for the government to assert that there is nothing that they can do. I'll give you a few examples. The first, there is at the moment an impediment to anybody who wishes to stand for election against uh, a female party. But this is not a requirement in our Constitution. In other words, it is not enshrined in the basic law. It is actually just a local legislation that places a ban on a chief executive candidate having individual obligation. In other words, if you wish to stand for election as a chief executive, you will have to sever your party affiliation. This is local legislation. In other words, if there is a consensus, and there is consensus among different political parties, including the left wing, largest political party in the legislative council. There is general agreement that the way forward for Hong Kong on constitutional reform is to develop a long political party line. So that one of these days, sooner rather than later, you will have a chief executive that has a pro-government party in the legislature and therefore be able to push through more effectively government programs, government legislation, with the proposals and the proposals. So that's the first thing that's Secondly, we have been urging my little think tank to come from the and many other organizations have been urging the introduction of more objective criteria for determining who is eligible to be a member of this 1,200 uh, election committee. Uh, in future, it may be increased to 1,600, it may be uh, uh, even larger than that. There is, at the moment, no objective criteria. They are purely subjective criteria set by the government in order to achieve one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to return members who will hold the objective We have four sectors comprising the uh, election committee. There is a lot that the government can to open up discussion on how these four sectors, or in, these, in, in the future, there will be more sectors, how members in these four sectors could be returned so that we raise the legitimacy and the representativeness of this uh, election committee. In the future, we will have a nominating committee. The basic law also makes clear that the nominating committee will be determined by members of the democratic process. And the basic law also explains what is meant by democratic process. It is as you and I understand democratic process, not the Chinese interpretation, which they are now fond of pointing before us, not their interpretation of what is democratic process. For example, the basic law sets out very clearly the two international conventions on civil, political, and economic and social rights that defines what is meant by universal suffrage should continue to apply to Hong Kong after the pandemic. There can be no doubt whatsoever what is meant by the universal suffrage. It means the right of every person 
not only to create both a regular and fair election, but also very much the right stand for election. Mrs. Carrington thinks that by um, resolving difficult so-called logical issues, such as addressing the problem of insecurity, making housing more affordable, uh, increasing job prospects and training for the younger generation, that this will be enough to keep Hong Kong people quiet and that in due course Hong Kong people will forget about their country. I think she is very wrong. Hong Kong people will never give up fighting for universal suffrage, particularly in the light of the recent few years where we have seen a steady erosion of everything that we hold here. Our core values, our lifestyle, rule of law, the protection of basic rights. And the younger generation particularly believe that it is only through genuine universal suffering, the right to elect our future leaders, that you can stop this deterioration in one country. Quite frankly, with the rate of deterioration and if the rest of the world doesn't speak up, particularly Britain, as a possibility to be done reservation, then my view is we do not have to wait until 2047 for one country to exist, one country to exist, to exist only in name, particularly in the light of what the foreign ministry, the Chinese foreign ministry, has said very recently about the, the, the fact that in their view, the Joint Declaration no longer has any practice. I hope sincerely that the British government will not just rest on the rebuttal that they issue, but that they will take more concrete action and take a stronger lead to remind China of its obligations to Hong Kong and to the wider international community. Thank you. Thank you, Anson. That was a very powerful and your criticism of uh, uh, Britain at the beginning and at the end. Uh, was merited and well deserved. Um, there's been some coverage uh, in the media, but uh, hardly what I had anticipated. I remember giving an interview once in Beijing um, several years ago, at the time of the Olympics, and uh, I was told by one of the journalists that if ever they dared to point out any problems at all with the smog or with the, the um, perhaps the loss of light in construction. They were called in to justify why they had said those remarks, and uh, it was very difficult for them to understand the freedom of the press, uh, that they, we have no control over them, uh, and never mind uh, the Chinese. Um, I'd also like to point out Jeffrey Clifton Brown and uh, Fiona Brusa here, both members of Parliament, both interested in the region, and uh, Jeffrey and I have been to, we've both led delegations uh, to uh, China, and have got uh, both interests in the region. Right, let's get on to questions. Keep, keep them short and sharp 